From the KSL Broadcast House, this is Sunday Edition with Doug Wright. Hey, good morning and welcome to Sunday Edition. This week, UDOT announced plans to move forward building a gondola in Little Cottonwood Canyon. And UDOT says the gondola will help with growing traffic concerns. And here to talk about the massive project is the UDOT project manager, Josh Vangera. Josh, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Before we get going, and we were chatting about this just before we went live on the air, and that is a lot of people have the perception, man, we're going to start building these gondolas today. The towers are going up. But actually, it's a little bit uh, more complex than that, and it's more of a two-step project. Correct. So UDOT is proposing a phased implementation of the gondola. So the long-term solution that UDOT has chosen as the preferred is Gondola B. But recognizing that we don't have funding for the gondola currently, and that it might actually take years to acquire that funding, either through fate, a federal, state, or private partnerships, we're proposing starting with components of that enhanced bus service, right? So improving and increasing the existing bus service, adding more parking through a mobility hub, and implementing tolling or occupancy restrictions. Boy, anybody who has been uh, using the canyon in peak time periods, wow, it is a different world than when I was skiing as a kid up these canyons. I still ski, but boy, not as often. And when you look at the backups and you look at the traffic, you look at the pollution and the wear and tear on the canyon, I think virtually everybody, regardless of whether they like the gondola idea ultimately or not, something has had to be done. And what kind of immediate effect, if, if we boost the bus service, for example, in the short term, what kind of a difference can and will that make on the canyon? So the goal of the project is to reduce private vehicles by roughly 30%. And that'll get it down to stable traffic flows. Because a mountainous road can handle roughly 1,000 vehicles per hour. And on those busy Saturday and Sunday mornings, yeah. We're seeing far more than that. And that's what's leading to that congestion, that queuing on 9400 South, back into Wasatch Boulevard that's preventing people to getting into and out of their homes. So that transition of 30% of the vehicles into transit is going to help protect the watershed. It's going to improve air quality. And it's going to improve the quality of life for those residents at the mouth of the canyon. Yeah, I've heard a lot from the residents <laughs> at the mouth of the canyon. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in the brief time we have, are the, the resorts cooperating? And, for example, it was Solitude that implemented uh, pricing for parking, mm -hmm. now Park City and the affiliated resorts up there. Is there something similar happening at the top of Little Cottonwood Canyon? So Alta does have a parking reg uh, reservation system. Um, but UDOT is proposing tolling and or occupancy restrictions as well. And we would obviously work with the resorts in, th in the implementation of that. Mm -hmm. But again, we really need to get that 30% of the vehicles into transit to make the roadway stable for all users, not just ski resort users, but the backcountry skiers, the sledders, right. and the people who just want to Go for a walk in the woods. Yeah, and people who have condos up there and just want to go up for a, a, a nice evening out. Let's talk about the longer term. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the actual gondolas. What is anticipated? What would be realistic? How many years are we going to be waiting? So that's a great question. Unfortunately, I can't answer it, again, because it's dependent upon funding. So we can't implement any alternative until we have a record of decision. And that's the final step in the EIS process. So right now, we've just released the final EIS. We have a 45-day comment period. We will read, review, and consider all of those comments and put that into consideration in issuing the ROD mm -hmm. or the record of decision. It's that funding component yeah. that's the unknown in the middle, but we anticipate that Advertising, procuring, and constructing a gondola system will take two to three years after funding has been identified. That was my next question. I was wondering, once we actually start construction, we have the funding at least to the point where we're comfortable to start, would it be a design and build, or do we know exactly what's, what it's going to look like and where and how it's going to go? So UDOT did do preliminary engineering, 
but they aren't final design plans, right? We used our independent engineers. We didn't use any vendors so we could be consistent for all of the alternatives. So there wasn't any bias in the engineering. So we would have to procure an actual designer and contractor. When, when I think of the, the gondola system, up at the upper end of the canyon, we're used to all kinds of lifts and even you know, gondolas and solitude and so on. There was a gondola back in the old days up in uh, Park City. And so the upper part of the canyon isn't what is bothering some people or they have questions about. It's that straight view. This is a glacier cut canyon. So you're going to see it all the way down. And so what, what is the reaction to that? How big are the towers going to be? Is, is the view of that classic glacial cut canyon going to be a, a big concern? So the view is certainly going to change with the gondola towers. I absolutely agree with that statement. Some of the towers, the tallest I believe is 262 feet. That is at the mouth of the canyon. There are towers numerous towers in that 200 foot range mm -hmm. um, and the alignment is very close to the edge of the road obviously it varies a little bit but it will be a visual change for yeah. users in the canyon i don't disagree with that i think the gondola brings a lot of other environmental benefits however that were all taken into consideration right it doesn't widen the road or add width for train tracks that could inhibit wildlife movement it also has a very small footprint for construction. So there's less earth disturbing activities, which is gonna help protect our watershed. Let's talk about the base of the canyon. And then unfortunately, I think we're gonna be about out of time. I know a lot of people are really concerned. Hey, that's great that we might limit the actual traffic on the road going up the canyon itself, but what's gonna happen at the mouth? And I know citizens who have built rather nice houses in that neighborhood are very concerned. Sure. So the base station is anticipated to be about three quarters of a mile northwest of the, where SR-210 and SR-209 are 94 south, mm -hmm. the mouth of the canyon. So it'll be about three quarters of a mile away on North Little Cottonwood Road. And there will be a parking structure there that can hold 2,500 vehicles. And a 35-person gondola cabin is expected to depart every two minutes. Now we've done our traffic modeling. We do not anticipate that private vehicles trying to drive up the canyon will block the entrance to that parking structure. So overall, they should have better access to their homes in that area than they do today. Okay. Well, there are 8 million questions that over the years we'll be addressing, but hopefully we scratch the surface. For those who want to go deeper in depth, can they go to the UDOT site and look at some of this? Absolutely. So all the final EIS is on our website, including all 14,000 comments that we got during the draft. So if you made a comment, you can go look up your comment number and then see our response to that comment. Okay. And also there's some overview videos and yeah, I hope everybody will take some time, review the materials and please submit comment. Josh, we thank you so much for joining us. Of course, thank you. Here on Sunday edition. And of course, some groups are voting uh, or voicing rather opposition to UDOT's plans for the Little Cottonwood Canyon gondola. One of them will be my guest coming up next. There are groups that are voicing concerns with UDOT's plan to build the gondola in Little Cottonwood Canyon, helping, of course, with the canyon's congestion. One of those groups happens to be the Wasatch Backcountry Alliance. And Brad Rutledge is here with us to talk about those concerns. Brad, let's, uh, we, we just had the chance to talk with Josh from UDOT. And first of all, what is your reaction to the plan? Are you surprised that it's coming out now? Uh, well... Uh, not at all surprised, disappointed. Um, I believe that public comments came out and somewhere in the range of 80% of, of Utahns were against the gondola. Um, our organization, Wasatch Backcountry Alliance and others, um, have been strongly um, opposed to the gondola. And so um, not surprised, just disappointed, hoping for a different outcome. However, uh, you know, the announcement that UDOT made had kind of a mixed bag in, in some ways. Uh, there's some hope in, in, in the sense that 
uh, we have the opportunity to try um, in implementing you know this enhanced bus service right, right. and uh, you know really encouraging people to change their behavior now because we can either wait for the government to implement something that people clearly don't want which is the gondola or we can take matters into our own hands and people can carpool uh, they can ride public uh, transportation they could take advantage of the Wasatch Backcountry Alliance mountain shuttle to get up and down their destination and limit uh, the cars that are that are in the canyon and, and help alleviate those traffic problems today. I want to talk about that because prior to going on the air, you and I were chatting about the shuttle programs and the different efforts that you have made, and we were talking about you know the the, shut, the, the gondola once it's up there, 200 some odd feet in the air, it's not dipping down to drop you <laughs> off at a, at a trailhead. It just goes up the canyon. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you know one of one of the concerns I, I guess that we have when we look at at this is you know the stated objective of this program is to improve roadway safety reliability and mobility on SR 210 State Road 210 for all users and um, it kind of a, um, something that really stands out is this is really not addressing all users so uh, all of the dispersed Canyon users meaning people that access trailheads to go hiking snowshoeing backcountry skiing there's no stops, just as you said, Doug, along the, the gondola route. It only has two stops. It's at uh, Snowbird and Alta, two private for-profit mm -hmm. ski resorts, um, which is fantastic. But we're definitely not addressing with the gondola all users with this solution. We, we've talked about this, and I talked about it with uh, Josh. Uh, there are s many who are concerned. This is such a unique canyon, the fact that it's glacially cut and it's straight, unlike big cottonwood that goes all over the place. Right. This is a straight cut, providing uh, an almost unprecedented, breathtaking view of the Salt Lake Valley from the very, very top of the canyon. And I'm trying to imagine what this canyon will look like and the effect on the, the just the viewscape. That's that right. this is going to have. Yeah, you know, a lot of people emotionally are really uh, tied to this view. And uh, as I've been monitoring this and highly involved in this for the last several years, every time I drive past Little Cottonwood, whether that's, you know, Wasatch Boulevard or from the highway, I always look up and I just say, capture this moment because it may not look like this forever. It's absolutely a spectacular canyon. People from all over the world come to Little Cottonwood Canyon for its beauty, for its recreation. And if, if you look at Mount Superior in itself, it is just a photographic postcard moment right there. And all the way up the canyon, it's just like that. So the views um, and forever changing Little Cottonwood Canyon is really a big concern that people have. And I think that's tied to uh, the concern that this won't work. Um, one of the things that our organization looked at is, is we dove deep into each of the alternatives that UDOT was considering, and we put together a podcast series called The Uptrack. And we have about 11, 12 hours of recorded material where we talk to everyone from the CDC uh, to UDOT to proponents of the gondola, busing, and the train. And we came to the clear conclusion that the gondola just won't work the way they want it to. And uh, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing any proof or evidence that people will ride the gondola when they want to go up in the winter to ski at Alta, at Snowbird, or access trails. It takes the longest of any transportation mode that's out there. It's going to be more expensive and more inconvenient. And on a day when you want to get up and get those fresh powder runs in, time is of the essence. And on the days where you have some time, time is still of the essence. People really want to do that. And so, you know, the view shed is, is definitely part of it. If the solution would work, you know, it might be a different story. We might be analyzing this a little bit differently. But in many ways, we look at this as the, uh, the big gamble. So the big gamble meaning there's a gamble that we're going to build this, you know, and, and we're estimating now it's going to be closer to $1 billion to build this thing, just with inflation wow. and prices. I asked Josh off the air, and he said maybe 500 to 550 you know, million, million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So that was their estimates. Now, if we look at other government programs where, you know, they do big projects like this, like the Salt Lake Airport, you know, they, these always exceed the, the estimated, you know, price tag. But mm -hmm. even if it were, you know, the, the half a billion dollars, it's still a lot of money on an unproven system uh, that we, we don't think is going to alleviate traffic problems. which We think it's going to add to crowding in the canyon. And, you know, Doug, one of the biggest concerns, and you get this, you, get, you understand the beauty of, of Little Cottonwood. Yeah. Once those towers are in, these are skyscraper-sized towers, 
Um, it, it, let's say that system doesn't work. Let's say uh, we want to take it out for some reason. Just be, you know. But in the future, there's no money. There's not going to be a budget to take those towers out. It will forever scar and damage the Little Cottonwood Canyon. You don't mention sky, uh, skyscraper height. I, I think a lot of people can't kind of grasp what 262 feet is. Is there something comparable that Utahns could kind of relate to a building, a landmark? Yeah, uh, Hotel Monaco I uh, was, was reading um, is kind of of that height. And so if you imagine standing at the base of Hotel Monaco, uh, downtown Salt Lake City, this is the kind of scale of what we're looking at. Uh, some of these towers are as tall, if not taller, than the, the, uh, the gondola that runs at Snowbird, if you've mm -hmm. seen that. Yeah. Um, and so these are massive. This will end up being the, long, the world's longest gondola. And so the impacts to this, I think we've got to get it right. We can't gamble and hope that this works out. We need to make sure that the solution does work to, to accomplish what we set out to do. As I mentioned with Josh, this is going to be an ongoing, ongoing conversation. But very quickly, for those who would like more information, do you have a website people can go to? Well, absolutely. And in fact, we, uh, just because this is an important thing to our community, um, we have a lot of information about this. As I mentioned with our okay. UpTrack series, 10, 12 hours of, of content, plus we have summaries, wasatchbackcountryalliance.org. Great. You can visit that and get a lot of information about what we're doing. Brad, thanks so much. Thank for you. For joining us on Sunday Edition, and we will be right back. Earlier this summer, the Utah Education Association welcomed its new president. Renee Pinckney stepped away from a teaching career 27 years and into a brand new role, and Renee, thank you so much for joining us on Sunday edition. And one thing that I hoped we could talk about, hopefully, and it, it ain't over yet, but I shouldn't say ain't when I'm talking to an educator <laughs> here, but COVID is still, it, it just seems to be ubiquitous. It seems to be, it's always the buzz and so on. Hopefully we're emerging out of it. And I think most of us believe that we are. But what effect has that had on education? And what do you anticipate for this year? In other words, what are the vibes? Well, what I anticipate for this year is that we have a lot of kids and staff members, whether it's administrators, teachers, paraprofessionals, librarians, counselors, that have either already had COVID or have gotten all of their vaccinations and boosters. And, and what I understand today in Summit County, there's a new booster that people can get and that we probably have a much brighter year mm -hmm. ahead of us in terms of kids and, and anybody in a building getting COVID. And yeah. teachers seem to be more energetic and looking forward um, to a normal year. Yeah, you were telling me it kind of feels like a new day. Yes. Which is, is good. With that new day and with the population of the state and some of the challenges that we've had in general, not just COVID, but what about the staffing shortages? We're hearing about it everywhere. I can't tell you how many businesses that I frequent and they're now on limited hours or they've closed on a Monday where they didn't used to because they just can't find the help. What about educators? Well, we know that there are still some teacher shortages in terms of just finding teachers um, to take on classes if people retired. And what that means for other teachers in the building or even our paraprofessionals is that they're asked to cover a class, which means then they may not have the amount of time they need to prepare for classes, to um, help students who might need help if, mm -hmm. if you're in a secondary school and they can come in when you have a prep period. So it really just puts a strain on the entire system. What is it going to take to kind of get back to, we've used the term normal, <laughs> it's yeah. kind of a relative term, but what is it going to take to get comfortably restaffed? Well, I think we have to have compensation packages that are competitive with other professions and then with our education support professionals. They need to be able to have uh, a, a wage that they can live on and when you can go get a job in a different industry and make more money per hour than you do in a school, it, it, you know, they have to do what's best for them. But we really rely on having a team approach to education and we need 
all of our education support professionals. Over the past several years, the Utah State Legislature and even our governors, Governor Herbert, Governor uh, Cox now, mm -hmm. have talked about unprecedented money flowing mm -hmm. into education. Independent groups like Envision Utah really dug into uh, what it would really take to bring teaching to the professional status that it richly deserves. Now that we're hopefully through COVID, do you, do you think a, more of a fire is going to be put under that? I think there will be more of a fire. And yes, we have had historic investments in public education. And I like to um, use the analogy of a drought. We were so chronically underfunded for so long, and now we've had some historic investments, but that doesn't get us out of the drought, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that understanding some of the inequities that were just brought to light as a result of the pandemic and the fact that we have a very diverse population that has needs and especially now because learning loss is is something that we're seeing right. i saw an article yesterday about um, test scores and that we've had we had the lowest student test scores in decades and so that's something that will be a challenge and we will need to have extra funding for that. Closing on a, a note of optimism because it is a new year and hopefully things are better on so many fronts. Just in the next half minute we have, what, what are you really looking forward to this year? And we, we talked about the new day and how realistic is that? I am really looking forward to getting out into classrooms and meeting with teachers and also being up on the hill for the legislative session. I have high hopes for education in the future and I just am looking forward to all of the partnerships. Renee, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to chat with you and we'll, we'll stay in touch during the school year. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Renee Pinckney with us here on Sunday. At and we appreciate you joining us today. Uh, tomorrow, we uh, actually next week, we're going to be back. We've got some great things planned for you. And Music in the Spoken Word is coming up next.